there? Yes, we have to keep us muted. Hello. Hi, Justin. Hello. Yes, Justin. Ma'am, live. Uh, yes, ma'am. Ma'am, live streaming. Chalu chali lai. Okay. Okay. So, admitting people because we told them to uh, to be on time. Hmm. Ani chatting chalu ahe. Kya? Chatting chalu nahi hai. Chalu bas chatting banda ke lai. Justin banda ke lai. Ah, chat kashala chalu paaje. Otherwise, they will come in and. They... YouTube sir. करशील Just keep on uh, your eyes on a waiting yes. room and Record check. Start ke le le. Recording starting. Okay. Has... okay. Uh, starting. I mean, you have been here. Ah. Okay. Ah, uh, yes. Recording start. Ke le me. Start. Ke le le. Yeah. Thank you, just. Okay, please see the time and then uh, start admitting people. Huh? If uh, time, hi, it's already five fifty-two. I think that we should start uh, admitting people. Pooja, what do you feel? Yeah, we must add people ah, now. Yes, yes, and start admitting people. We'll keep ourselves mute for a moment. Yes. And we will we will chat on WhatsApp, okay? Yeah. So keep okay. on admitting. Yeah. Let me. Hmm. Admit start करोगे मैं? हो हो. Just check whether Tejas sir, Tejas sir has joined or not.
जनगण मन अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य
तेजस सर यू कैन यूट योर सेल्फ यस I think Pooja, uh, you have uh, made me co-administrator, so I'm saying. Ah, uh, sir, this is Samiksha. Uh, actually, I made made you co-host so that you can unmute yourself. I think now I can, uh, uh, you know, take up that. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Sir, can we start the session? Of course, of course, I'm ready. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I welcome you all for the national webinar on history of gunnery in India. I also welcome our resource person, Dr. Tejas Birke Sir, our honourable principal, Dr. Debajit Sarkar, IQSC coordinator, Dr. Anupama Nirukarman, and my entire team for this webinar. Before we start, I request you all to stand in honour of our national anthem. जनगण मन अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल बंगा विंध्य हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जलदि तरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभाशिष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जनगण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे thank you everyone now i would like to give you a brief introduction of our institution sadna education society's ls rehija college of and arts and commerce is a premier educational institute situated in the heart of mumbai suburb santa cruz west it is a gujarati speaking linguistic minority institution established in 1980 it offers quality oriented education from higher secondary to doctoral program it has a program ranging from ba bcom bms bbr bfm bath psc it bmm etc post graduate program in commerce as well as phd center in commerce the institution's vision is to cultivate creative and productive talent of student faculty and staff and it seeks ways to contribute to the nation to the well being of communities and strives to enhance the quality of life and development of its students and faculty our institution continuously strive to impart education to enable its stakeholder to face the emerging challenges of the future with this vision and mission we have been organizing various online programs and webinars in this down period now i request our honorable principal dr devajit sarkar to speak a few words हेलो पूजा यस समीक्षा मैम आई थिंक सर सर हैज नॉट अनम्यूटेड हिमसेल्फ या नाउ आई कुड गेट इट इट वाज इट वाज ग्रो दैट यू रे सर नाउ नाउ यू आर ऑडिबल सर या नाउ यर ऑडिबल बिकॉज़ यू हैव मेड मी दैट इट आई कुड नॉट अनम्यूट इट एनीवे अच्छा ओके गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल आई ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ 
Ellis Raheja College of Arts and Commerce, and on my personal behalf, extend a hearty welcome to Dr. Tejas Gargey. Dr. Gargey is the director of Directorate of Archaeology and Museums, Government of Maharashtra. He is the right person to speak on this topic, history of Ganeri in India. I am extremely happy that uh, the history department has organized this national level seminar. along with the iqc of the college <clears throat> and samiksha how many participants are today sir uh, there are 336 and more are coming okay. currently so 336 also a very good statistic the 300 300 plus listeners are there to listen to dr tejaji garge without taking any wasting for the time i would request samiksha madam to introduce the guest thank you uh sir pooja ma'am is going to introduce the guest okay okay yeah. pooja ma'am thank you sir thank you so much sir now i'll introduce the resource person of our webinar dr tejas gurge sir dr tejas gurge the present director of archaeology government of maharashtra is working in the field of archaeology and heritage management for past two decades specializing in harappan civilization and firearms his other areas of interest are museum and exhibition indian art and architecture port exhibition heritage management and legislation dr gurge completed his phd from the deccan college pune and pg diploma in field archaeology from institute of archaeology new delhi he worked as research associate in indian archaeological society then in asi as an assistant archaeologist from 2003 and signed off as a deputy superintendent archaeologist in 2007 he directed excavation at konchi and participated in many excavation national importance He led several archaeological expeditions, leading to discovery of petroglyph in Konkan archaeological site in Mizoram, Haryana, Gujarat, and Maharashtra. He was deputed to China as the curatorial associate for international exhibition Treasures of Ancient India, and to Paul Getty Museum, USA, for an international workshop on the research. Dr. Gurge has presented paper in various seminars and delivered talks. he associated with various university as a resource person and visiting faculty he is a member of the academy society the governor heritage society and trustee at csmbs mumbai he has authored two environment and settlement pattern of harappan civilization in jodhpur basin and aurangabad and its neighborhood he has presented and published 35 research paper and popular writings in newspaper as well as magazine in english and marathi so i welcome you once again thank you so much for accepting our invitation before sir begin his presentation i would like to make some announcement participants are requested not to write their names or good wishes in the chat box we appreciate your good wishes but it will be difficult to find your question and other queries by the host please note that the box will not I request you to put the relevant to be asked to the resource person in the chat box. Feedback link will be shared during the session in the chat box, both on Zoom and as well as YouTube. Only those who submit the feedback link will get the e certificate. Now, I request Dr. Tejas Gurge sir to begin the presentation. Uh, sir you need to unmute yourselves again uh samiksha 
Yes. Yes, sir. You can start the session. Thank you. Uh, I will now. Yes, sir. All right. So, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Honorable Principal Sir, uh, Samiksha Ma'am, uh, Pooja Ma'am. Thank you so much for inviting me here to deliver a talk on uh, canons in ancient India, or uh, rather, uh, history of gunnery in India, which is one of the lesser known topics uh, in Indian context. Uh, uh, I would request uh, Samiksha ma'am to uh, uh, remove me as a co-admin so I don't uh, see flashes of messages. Sure, sir. I'm, un uh, I'm unable to see presentation. Okay. But I hope I stay unmuted. Uh -huh. Yeah, sure, sir. I'll try that. Sir, right now, you uh, are you able to see the screen, sir? No, I am seeing all the messages of people entering into waiting room. Acha. So. Okay, I'll I'll uh, share the screen again, sir. Then. Mm -hmm. No, uh, screen is visible, but it is hidden behind the messages. Those are flashing okay. continuously. Uh, okay. Screen Sir, is it visible now? I have withdrawn the co-hostship. Yes. Better now. Yeah. Okay, I hope sir. audible. So good, good evening to everyone again. Uh, thank you for having me here. And let us begin with this uh, wonderful journey. So first of all, I understand that uh, all of you are either students of history or you're interested in history. Uh, so um, you need to, why we need to understand guns or cannons? So many a times we see this magnificent pieces of artillery lying on forts and we approach them, we take pictures with them and uh, well, uh, uh, these are the cannons which were used in several warfare and we take pride into them but I think uh, they also deserve a special attention from the perspective of uh, documentation studies and we need to use this uh, as a database while reconstruct uh, reconstructing our military past uh, well there were many bottle pots in medieval India and uh, of course, this was the uh, weapon which was applied in several battlefields uh, for taking forts, for defending forts. Uh, so we need to understand what cannon is, basically. So uh, not too many people know that <coughs> in medieval era, most of the cannons were muzzle-loading cannons. Now we need to understand some basic parts. See, cannon is nothing but a plain cylinder which is sealed on one side and open on another. So the open side is always called as the mouth of the cannon and uh, the back side is called as the breech or cascable. The, the projected part at the end is always referred as cascable. So... Uh, these medieval cannons were essentially muzzle-loading cannons. So they were fed from the mouth. So you'll see there's a hollow tubular cylinder space inside, which is more or less parallel. Uh, and this, this particular cylinder, actually it is path uh, for the projectory, uh, which is kept inside, which we also know as uh, shell. Uh, and you know, uh, in modern context, this shell, uh, this shell is composite. Uh, you also have firepower mixed with uh, metallic parts, uh, which explode now. But uh, in those days, uh, you have to feel gunpowder, first of all, inside uh, this chamber. And after that, you put cannonball and you light this through vent hole 
which is seen at the back side of the cannon back side is again which or cascabel so this is a rough idea so uh, i'll be essentially using this terms uh, tronions tronions are basically handles of the cannons which are a cylindrical projection seen on the either side of the cylinder of the gun the cascabel is backside backside projection and muzzle is face or mouth part of the cannon so these are the basic functional components uh, of uh, uh, a muzzle loading gun and they were essentially smooth bore cannons what is bore of the gun the inside hollow cylindrical part is called as the bore of the cannon and initially they were smooth bore so there were no specific grooves which were made on the interior barrel of the cannon but in later part they made grooves and they were known as rifled bore cannons but whatever guns that we see on our forts in medieval context <coughs> most of them are uh, smooth bore cannons next slide please next uh, yes thank you so uh, this is how a uh, cannon was operated uh, now you can see its section and uh, you can see that uh, on the back side the gunpowder is filled and in front of that you will see a solid uh, ball uh, of the cannon placed inside the uh, uh, placed inside the cannon you, you can refer to the color part of the picture <coughs> and uh, where a section of the cannon is cut and one can see through a wooden stick this is all pushed really hard at the back side so one need to understands what exactly happens when a cannon is fired actually gunpowder is a very uh, unstable or highly unstable mixture of saltpeter uh, uh, charcoal uh, and uh, uh, saltpeter uh, uh, charcoal and sulfur so this is highly explosive and uh, uh, this is uh, this this is mixed uh, in form of powder and suddenly this solid form is converted into ga gases if it is uh, introduced with fire so even if there is a single spark of fire this entire solid state powder turns into gas in fraction of second and uh, the volume of that gas is much more larger than the volume of the powder so obviously it expands and with that expansion it tries to find out its way so there is this solid uh, portion uh, of cannon barrel where this explosion takes place and only way uh, uh, to go out or for the uh, to expand for that gas is the barrel uh, of the gun and that, uh, and uh, so so the cannon ball is actually uh, in the way of gun uh, gas uh, which is uh, trying to get out so obviously it pushes that cannon ball and that is how cannon ball goes out of the cannon so uh, in initial period they use stones uh, those stones were solid in state and in later on they have used iron initially i uh, solid iron balls were introduced and in later period they introduced hollow iron balls and then later on they filled up that hollow space inside iron cannon ball with uh, gunpowder so uh, first explosion would take place inside the cannon to th throw out that ball if that ball is of solid uh, stone or metal it will fall on enemy and it will destroy an enemy because it will great uh, it will travel with great velocity velocity and it will have a great impact wherever it is obstruct and if at all that cannon ball is Uh, hollow and if it is filled with gunpowder then obviously on obstruction it will explode and that is how uh, the gun functions and 
on one part of the screen you are seeing basic drill of firing the gun so you will see uh, mi- minimum requirement to operate uh, a medieval cannon is minimum 5 so there are actually two people who are clean who are engaged in cleaning uh, and uh, loading the gun and uh, there are at least two people who looks after it maneuvering uh, it's turning uh then uh, there is a one uh, supervisor which was basically called as a topchi in medieval times who was the master uh, person uh, of this group who could aim and who knew to what level the m- muzzle of the cannon needs to be raised uh, or how to aim and how to fire so this was the basic drill of firing the gun next please let's see an interesting story uh, that how gunpowder has come into existence well uh, you know uh, the story starts on china uh, just like corona virus the uh, The, the the art of making uh, gunpowder has also originated uh, from china and uh, you will be surprised to know that the origin of gunpowder is something around 2nd century bc actually chinese emperor had commissioned a few alka- uh, uh, alchemist to come up with uh, a substance which will provide uh, immortality of life human beings and uh, they were experimenting with uh, several things and uh, when they were experimenting with sulfur charcoal and saltpeter they discovered that this is highly unstable and this can explode so the research was actually initiated to find immortality of human life ultimately ended up with finding something that destroys the human life well <laughs> coming back to our story th- these are depictions of uh, some of the chinese scriptures which shows how uh, the gunpowder uh, was initially used uh, it, it was put into smaller pots uh, stuck to the uh, uh, one side of bamboo and that is how it was shot either in form of arrow or in form of uh, javelin and uh, in the middle you are seeing some uh, egg uh, shaped objects of terracotta those were basically uh, filled with gunpowder and then they were placed along with this bamboo uh, and one can also see the, uh, that they have provided fire power to arrows by putting up gunpowder in uh box and uh, that actually projected arrows uh, after the gunpowder was fired and later on uh, they came up with a tube well initially this tube was made of uh, bamboo and uh, the initial cannons were small uh, and uh, once you feel this bamboo and once you shoot arrow or uh, some gunshot they were of say use and throw type so uh, they were almost throwing it off after uh, each uh, single shot or after uh, two or three shots so uh, it was also dangerous to have that exploding thing in hand inside bamboo tube so they tried to strengthen that uh, by placing metal straps around it and ultimately they came up with a shape in casted form which is seen in, in front of you uh, the <clears throat> picture color picture with red background is of a small chinese handgun uh, which is not more than uh, say uh, uh, half uh, which is not more than half a meter long and uh, at the bottom you are seeing another cannon uh, which came uh, to its shape around 12th or 13th century in china so that is how chinese uh, developed gunpowder the gunpowder was being used for long time for decoration purpose uh, it was being used uh, as explosive 
but it was not applied uh, in the tubular form of cannon till 7th century ad uh, so in 7th century ad we see this uh, continuous development in china uh, in form of uh, cannon next please next slide please well chinese were continuously attacked by mongols <clears throat> so slowly mongols also acquired uh, this technology and mongols were also raiding the central part of the europe uh, central asia and uh, parts of turkey so probably they were the catalyst uh, for spreading uh, gunpowder around the world some scholars also claim that europe has got its own uh, history of gunpowder but uh, these are few pictures uh, from europe uh, from which one can make out that a beginning of gunpowder does not go back more than uh, 11th or 12th century ad and it was used in a quite different form earlier we are saying pigeon with a uh, flying pigeon with a pot of gunpowder then you have a dog uh, attacking with fire and then you can see ships attacking on each other <clears throat> and interestingly they were using something called nafta and this nafta was highly explosive uh so these are some of the indirect evidences before the introduction of proper fire power uh, of cannons next slide please next yes i can see comments of the people talking about introduction of cannons during mughal period so i'm coming to a very interesting point uh where all of us have learned uh, that babur was the first one to introduce cannon uh, in india he fought with a small army of uh, say 8000 soldiers again 1 lakh strong army of lodi uh, with elephants and all and uh, in spite of uh, this great difference in numbers babur babur could win that war because of smart application of cannons but uh, my dear friends even i grew up with the same misconception before i started work on uh, cannons so uh, while we were working on cannons of in goa we came across some references uh, those were prior to the battle of panipat so we definitely knew that there was gunnery Uh, there was artillery which was used prior to the mughals in uh, deccan so uh, so let's let's uh, question ourselves that whatever uh, we have learned so far in our history textbook we need to verify that so next slide now we'll look into typology of cannons in the initial period you will see cannons were essentially made from bronze uh, that is is in copper tin uh, was mixed in certain uh, percentage in order to give strength and uh, these alloys uh, uh, were molded i mean uh, uh, if you are familiar with the process of casting Uh, on left hand corner you will see that some of the molds are placed in vertical fashion and those molds they contain actually shape of the gun so that's a hollow shape of the gun so first of all you need to make a positive copy either in wood or something else and then you need to put clay on top of it in order to have a negative image or to have a mold then these molds are joined together in a single piece uh, and uh, in this hollow space you pour molten metal so uh, that is how these are 
casted with process of uh, last tracks also sometimes so in the uh, initial period uh, they were bronze alloys and choice was obvious as uh, you know to make this bronze alloy you need to have a temperature of about 600 to 700 degrees uh, which was uh, possible uh, to have from the uh, primitive uh, type of uh, 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 primitive type of uh, Um, technology. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Well, this is another technology that is uh, very commonly seen on Maharashtrian ports, and we often refer to them as Bangri Cha Tofa. So. what do you see on this cannons are rings rings made of iron and uh, you know uh, what we see on outside is only rings but those rings are actually placed on horizontal stars which actually makes the barrel or interior part of the cannon through which cannon ball rolls so um, in the in the diagram on top uh, part you will see uh, the Uh, horizontal stars and how uh, those iron rings are put uh, on this and in india we also had a special variety of detachable chamber type of cannons next please well there were composite cannons as well so you will see interior part is essentially made with horizontal stars of iron so the reddish image that you are seeing those are basically horizontal stars made in iron then again they were further strengthened with rings of iron and uh, further on top of that uh, a copper casing or a bronze casing was given so that uh, it serves the both purposes the first purpose is to sustain blast uh, which is uh, uh, which was dealt in better fashion by application of iron in the interior of the barrel and uh, you know the copper alloy does not corrode easily uh, on surface or on air so the outer casing was given in copper alloy and interior part was made of uh, iron so uh, you can understand the uh, copper alloy guns they also had this tendency to leave the shape after explosion so uh, in, in later that uh, you will see the gunners have preferred iron guns as uh, compared to bronze guns because they needed more time to cool down they were little clumsy to clean them off and uh, 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 iron guns could sustain that blast of gunpowder in better fashion they did not leave a shape of the barrel so once actually you lose shape of barrel you cannot aim and fire accurately next slide please well going back to europe again uh, this is how uh, one can see cannons were introduced in the early uh, period in europe that was something around 13th century ad so you uh, essentially they call cannons early cannons as vas so you you will see a picture uh, a drawing of a vas uh, and you will see a, a spear or arrowhead is placed uh, uh, inside the vas uh, so they were not really firing any cannon balls from that but they were actually shooting large arrows or spears through this vas so uh, on your right is actual picture of the vase and on left hand side uh, there is a old drawing which shows how they were being used and slowly this small vases grew into large cannon but of course we should also give credit to uh, uh, people from turkestan or turkey uh, because the the large cannon that you are seeing uh, in green color Uh, that is cast by uh, turkish people 
and uh, this is one of the uh, largest cannons ever casted in bronze in the world the cannon of dardanelles even uh, there is a reference of uh, using this war uh, the, using this cannon in the first world war also well on your left you have famous uh, meg uh, honest from scotland that is also a, a cannon uh, of forge welding made with several series of rings of iron and this has impacted greatly the medieval architecture of europe now instead of a straight fortification wall and rectangular uh, or circular bastions you have a star shaped fortifications uh, on which uh, cannon ball may not have the same impact as they had in straight walls uh, even bastions were also triangular due to introduction of gunnery uh, you must have seen uh, fortifications in revenda or vasai on bombay uh, where uh, triangular cannons are seen uh, the triangular bastions are seen this was a pure impact of introduction of art of gunnery next slide please next slide please well uh, this is a very famous cannon which we call uh, muluk maidan tof Uh, this is a very common phrase in marathi language uh, if, if uh, this is a very common term referred to uh, girls or women uh, who are fires they are often compared with muluk maidan so what is this like 90% of the people who actually use this term they don't know what muluk maidan stands for so this was one of the largest cannons which was casted by uh, nizam shah of ahmednagar and then this uh, muluk maidan was transported to uh, uh, war against bijapur sultan uh, it was captured and now it is placed on one of the bastions of bijapur but original name of this cannon was malik a maidan and uh, obviously uh, in marathi it was corrupted as muluk maidan and still it is being used in the same fashion so uh, you will see that this cannon was actually crafted in 1548 uh, and uh, the, the uh, person who actually cast it his name is also inscribed and you will often see title rumi at the end of the name so rumi is not, nothing but it refers to a person from turkestan so you will see that lot of uh, turkish people were employed by <coughs> this uh, dynasty in deccan um, for the purpose of atishbaji and uh, so this is again reexamination of uh, the question whether the mughals were the uh, actually uh, there were mughals who introduced gunnery in india next slide please well uh, this is another picture a beautiful miniature showing uh, gold, uh, the, the wall at bijapur in progress and on your forefront you see emperor aurangzeb uh, leading his warfare against bijapur and on his background you will see lot of black lines just before the fortification these are essentially cannons raised to destroy fortifications or even uh, they are raised at high angle so mostly they are acting like a howitzer so again we need to understand cannons mostly fire in horizontal uh, fashion once they are raised to an angle of 45 degree they are called as howitzers so they are acting like howitzers they uh, cross fortification walls and uh, they throw shells inside the city next please next slide please 
well these are few again uh, miniature paintings to see how cannons have been effectively used now uh, you'll see that uh, uh, small boats are approaching uh, fortifications and on forts uh, you will see mounted cannons and even boats are also mounted with small uh, cannons and on your right again you have uh, cannons on both side the people who have laid siege uh, around the fort they are also using cannons and uh, uh, people from forts are also using cannons and on boat you will see this lighter variety which uh, which was famously known as shutanal in the later period next slide please next slide please yes so now we see application of large cannons and uh, the miniature on your right hand side uh, it is shown with uh, uh, three cannons which are placed on fortification and uh, you will easily notice that the cannon in the middle is shown in lighter color or yellowish color so we can safely presume that this was manufactured with uh, the copper alloy and other two were iron cast iron uh, cannons or uh, cannons uh, forged out of iron and uh, on uh, on on the right corner uh, you will see a line of people trying to lift a cannon over fortification so there is a series of bulls and uh, 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 humans which are actually trying to pull the cannon up to the fortification next please now the uh, story of uh, this particular weapon began from a handheld cannon uh, but from handheld it grew to a large shape uh, cannons and later on they also thought of reducing the size so that it can suit uh, or serve a purpose of a single person so uh, the uh, guns uh, which we call rifles uh, today uh, they were also invented in the medieval periods they were known by several names uh, for example tufang so shatunal was again a short version of cannon but it was still a cannon hand cannon uh, in which uh, diameter uh, of the bow or uh, diameter of the cannon ball was of a certain size but later on they introduced very small dia uh, cannons which we call as tufang or bandook today and this particular miniature it shows emperor aurangzeb on hunting expedition so this was not only a war weapon but this was also used as recreation for hunting and it must have had uh, some tremendous recoil uh, as uh, uh, one can see aurangzeb has placed it uh, in 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 between two tree branches and then he is shooting deer and uh, those were not automatic cannons so uh, uh, these these sorry uh, those guns were not automatic uh, they were breech uh, they were not also breech loading but they needed to be loaded from muzzle or from mouth so you will invariably see another person behind him with loaded gun so once he fires it he will hand it over back to another person so while the shooter is shooting that uh, gun Uh, the other person will load it so <clears throat> there were actually two people who were needed to operate this muzzle loading uh, handgun next slide please next slide please yes so now we also come to another variety of cannon uh, which are pretty short in length and uh, one way, one can see how they were actually used i mentioned about howitzers and uh, their particular angle something around 45 degree but even mortars could be applied in an angle say between 
45 to 80 degrees so uh, this will be used with a very uh, raised or steep angle so it will fire a shot up in the air then uh, that shot will fall down with a great velocity velocity so purpose of using mortar was not to break uh, walls of the fortifications but to cross walls uh, up above in the air without destroying them uh, on top you are seeing uh, a picture a other drawing uh, uh, of battle of madangad and in which one can see how mortars and cannons are being shot so this is a live uh, scene uh, captured by the painter so one can see those cannons are shooting in straight angle so uh, whatever they are shooting it is going in straight line and it is also shown with straight line but mortar is being shot at an angle so it uh, escalates up in the air and travels in curvature then it falls on the target so this is the basic difference between uh, mortar and a cannon and uh, at bottom uh, in with red background you will also appreciate very beautiful mortars cast by tipu sultan in form of uh, lion so uh, the gunneries uh, guns are also wonderful pieces of art as you can see in this particular example next please well uh, uh, at some places uh, we achieved uh, great length in technology but unfortunately uh, its physical evidence is now missing a uh, very famous memoir of emperor akbar akbar in ama talks about cannon uh, which can be assembled at the location so this particular cannon was created in parts uh, one uh, does not know whether it, it is attached to each other with some kind of screw fitting that we have seen in cannon uh, at istanbul uh, or constantinople or uh, we are not sure exactly how this pieces were fitted to each other but akbar uh, had uh, access to this particular technology and there are detailed references where this pieces of uh, single cannon are transported uh, on different different on the back of different animals and uh, they were assembled at a particular spot uh, at a height Uh, from which one can take a proper shot and if you want to take this entire cannon on the same spot it might have been pretty difficult but if you carry part it becomes quite easier but unfortunately there is not even a single uh, evidence archaeological evidence of this type of cannon uh, we have to rely only upon uh, literary evidence that is the tanama next slide so uh, cannon technology uh, more grew so just to increase fire power uh, the barrels of the guns were attached together as you can see in the bottom example the large cannons attached together then smaller shape of uh, cannons were placed by each other and even top of each other so i would say this was a kind of prototype of modern rocket launcher where you can see number of barrels are seen placed together but of course they cannot be fired with a single click uh, they had to be lit in a different different way and so uh, in later period uh, one can see that we have uh, come over this deficiency to increase our fire power next please next slide please can we have next slide yes this is famous picture uh, and uh, no uh, every maharashtrian would like to forget uh, this particular event uh, and uh, it's it's hard to wipe out this terrible memory 
which we have faced in medieval era and still many people use this phrase uh, panipat dhala uh, so exactly uh, what uh, what they mean by this i mean you are lost something we actually lost at panipat and this is the uh, miniature of panipat battle where you can see cannons are placed facing each other behind each other so cannons are used in large number by the time we come to battle of panipat next please next uh, yes thank you so let us go a little back in time and see what kind of weaponry uh, we evolved with in our proto historic past one can see uh, weapons and implement made out of copper and stone in proto historic period when harappan civilization was in existence next slide please and these weapons were being used against these type of fortifications we have absolutely no direct evidence indicating that any war took place and these particular weapons were used uh, there is hardly a, any existence of uh, literature on harappan contemporary literature uh, and many scholars tend to think that this was a peaceful mercantile society but if you look at history of uh, human existence violence has remained a very basic nature of uh, our very existence so it's hard to believe that uh, there was absolutely no violence during harappan times but these uh, the, the architectural entities and uh, the weaponry was essentially of copper during uh, proto historic india next slide please let us come to historical period let us see how we improved upon uh, our weaponry uh, we see a man holding a uh, arrow and a bow uh, uh, with a single curve then you see a man with double uh, bend double bend bow the second uh, picture these are essentially from ajanta caves and i uh, i i recall a documentary on chengiz khan uh, sh uh, showing uh, that uh, he he was credited for innovating this double bend uh, or double uh, bow shaped arrow uh, sorry uh, double uh, uh, bend shaped bow uh, but Uh, this particular painting is from 5th century ad much much prior to uh, birth of chengiz khan so we knew for sure that uh, a variety of uh, weapons were existing uh, in ancient india if you look at sculptures there is a chakra there is a trishul khadag and you will see gods with uh, different different weaponry club or the gada was one of the Uh, major weapons which was used katya uh, different different type of swords next slide please next slide please and uh, these weapons were being used against these fortifications made in stone mud uh, which were assuming different different shapes uh, as per nature and everything change in the medieval period with introduction of fire power or cannons so far what you are seeing are essentially single lines of protection or single lines of perimeter walls no you hardly see any introduction of double walls either one behind another or on top of each other you hardly see any uh, evidence of uh, double fortification in historical period but the story changes uh, after introduction of cannons in india 
नेक्स्ट स्लाइड प्लीज नेक्स्ट स्लाइड प्लीज वेल इंस्टेड ऑफ सोर्स एंड बोज एंड एरोज नाउ यू हैव अ मेटल ट्यूब विच फायर a metal or stone ball with a great velocity and how you can defend against that next slide next slide please yes so you can defend from those weapons with fortifications made out of stone in a particular shape by giving Uh, double uh, battlement in form of uh, uh, double bastions double line of fortifications and so on so in medieval period uh, the shape of uh, fort totally changed you don't see uh, a gateway of any medieval fortification straight away open uh, for entrance it is always twisted or tilted so you cannot actually see the face of the door uh but uh, it is the zigzag uh, entry is there as uh, uh, the the uh, uh, they are trying to ensure that no cannon ball directly hits doorway which is the most vulnerable part of the medieval fortification next slide please well this is roughly map of deccan and uh, we'll see how uh, things are working from the perspective of gandhari so this is largely an area to the uh, south of uh, river narmada encompassing all the seas uh, but whenever somebody refers to dakkan or deccan usually the tip of the indian peninsula is omitted Uh, parts of kerala and tamil nadu uh, minus that the whole triangular portion encompassing modern uh, maharashtra karnataka uh, parts of telangana andhra pradesh are uh, taken as deccan or dakkan next please next slide please yes and this dakkan was uh, protected by several fortified entities uh, uh, you are saying uh, janjira and many of you your family hello 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 tejo sir uh hello tejo sir you are uh, you have to unmute sir you are muted acha yes. ha okay thank you i think now am i audible yes yes yeah. thank and, you and uh, sir just want to say that uh, uh, we are actually you know pressing the button for the next uh, slide but it takes few seconds to go ahead sure sure thank you thank you Uh, so uh, the bottom picture is of uh, dalotabad fort and you will also see some hill forts uh, like uh, rajgarh and all of them uh, they have seen this application of this particular technology in form of uh, cannons or gun powder next please next well uh, all of you you are familiar with the uh, political backdrop of deccan so let us not go into those details uh, next slide please so uh, we'll focus uh, on different different parts of uh, maharashtra uh, so uh, you uh, the fort of dalotabad located in mathwada has uh, yielded evidence of about uh, 288 cannons 
for which uh, there is a very good projection of understanding how gunnery developed in this area so let's have a look uh, in form of new slide this is the fort of dalatabad three fortification walls the central part is carved out of rock so the citadel is well protected next slide please so this was ruled by several uh, rulers after yadavas and I, i'm not emphasizing uh, yadava period here because it did not see any introduction of uh, cannons or uh, gunpowder in khilji or sultanat period uh, there are certain evidences of introduction of atishbaji uh, but uh, we are not sure whether it was uh, part of warfare and it exactly whether it meant uh, towards use of cannons uh, it could be simply introduction of gunpowder uh, and uh, not using cannons next slide please so after khalji uh, you know tughlaqs uh, shifted their capital from delhi to devgiri and renamed that place as dalatabad they were responsible for many of the enlargements of the forts but again uh, there is no clear cut archaeological evidence of uh, use of any gunnery by tughlaq rulers next please so these are uh, typical bastions uh, of tughlaq period uh, tapering bastions uh, which actually uh, tried to resist Uh, against the initial phase of firepower, and later on, uh, the the total approach of weaponry change. So they did not require uh, this type of uh, tapering bastions in the later period, but they increased height of fortification, which is quite visible in Dalatabad itself. Next piece. Thereafter, you saw mighty Bahmanis who basically ruled from Gurbaga in the later part. But uh, very few people know that they started their career from Dalatabad and uh, later on expanded their empire to entire Deccan Peninsula. And Bahmanis were responsible for many uh, uh, architectural entities of Dalatabad and. Uh, you must have heard name of mohammad gawan during bahmani period there is a clear cut record uh, of mohammad gawan employing firans for the purpose of atishbaji and this time uh, we are sure that it was used for the purpose of warfare so bahmanis were the first one to introduce cannon in context of deccan in india and that is uh, Quiet prior to uh, Babur's uh, war with Lodi. Next slide, please. The uh, outermost fortification of Dalatabad uh, is believed to have been uh, uh, constructed by Nizam Shah, as the uh, outer fortification is also known by the. Mm, uh, known of uh, known by the name of Nizam Shahi Emperor, uh, oh sorry, uh, uh, by uh, Prime Minister of uh, Nizam Shahi uh, uh, Malik Ambar, and during uh, Ahmad Nagar's uh, Nizam Shah's period, gunnery or uh, casting of the gunpowder was established technology. Uh, in Ahmad Nagar, there are several evidences of uh, foundries. you also have a tomb of master craftsman who uh, casted that famous malike maidan uh, it is still seen in ahmad nagar uh, the the tomb of person who cast malike maidan so nizam in nizam shahi period uh, ganari was definitely thriving next slide please
definitely moguls were responsible for large scale of uh, application of artillery we also saw evidences in form of uh, uh, use of uh, multiple uh, metals in the same cannon uh, so this composite cannons for the creation of aurangabad aurangzeb's time and he also invested a lot in development of uh, cannons and artillery next slide please so maratha uh, their rule was very flimsy on dalhabad they ruled it for a very short period of time and we know that it was handed over to nizam of hyderabad uh, in the later period but uh, there is a ganesh temple uh, on the half level of the temple of dalhabad and uh, uh, asi uh, while doing some clear clearance work archaeological survey of india uh, found cannon balls buried next to this temple even if you look at finial or kalsha of this temple it is made out of solid stone cannon balls not too many people realize this but uh, cannon balls are also seen in this type of context next please well if you try to divide uh, this 270 cannons uh, as per the metal so the cast iron cannons definitely uh, dominate uh, followed by uh, wrought iron guns uh, then uh, few bronze guns are seen but i believe in the early period there must have been a lot of bronze cannons which were melted uh, for different purpose uh, when uh, iron was order of the day uh, bronze was either forgotten or sidelined or was being used in a limited scale <clears throat> next slide please well this is one evidence from dalhabad of a, a cast bronze gun and this particular cannon is known as aurang pasan to uh, well you might think that this cannon now belongs to aurangzeb but uh, my friends aurangzeb never uh, represented himself in any institution singularly aurang he always represented himself with his full title which we will see on menda cannon later on so uh, literally aurang means shahinsha or the throne and uh, this was favorite cannon of the throne so that is how one can interpret and this is bronze cannon and from its manufacturing technique most probably this was a cast of nizam shahi period and uh, at the back side uh, towards the cascable uh one can see the uh, upper uh, right corner one can see uh, it's it's very difficult but uh, still i will try to describe it there is a tiger holding dead deer in its mouth and this is what is carved uh, on the cascable of the gun and you will see uh, the breech uh, part is almost parallel with the uh, muzzle or the mouth so Uh, uh this this is one of the early features of the bronze uh, technology next slide please this is small handgun uh, in form of uh, uh, brass so uh, this is a smaller variety in the same material or uh, same technique of uh, bronze casting could be operated by a single person next slide please well this is all together a different technology of forge welding where we have seen introduction of barrel of horizontal iron stars and placement of circular rings 
on top of it so uh, some of the most heavy weight cannons in dalatabad are made with rot and or uh, forged welded technology and advantage of this particular technique was to one could fire a very large size of cannon balls uh, some of them uh, uh, the diameter of the cannon ball was almost up to 46 cm almost half a meter uh, dia of cannon ball could be fired through such cannons next slide please and uh, there are two types in forged welding uh, the first type where we saw it is like any other can the back side is uh, sealed or closed but here uh, you have a special uh, variety where the back side could be detached and this back side was essentially filled with gunpowder so you can have multiple number of gunpowder chamber uh to increase your rate of fire power but uh, this technology did not prevail uh, probably due to a lot of problems of leakage of gases from this temporary contact area uh, all clumsiness or weight uh, there could have been many issues but this was this technology uh, was quite prevailed in 16th and early part of 17th century but in later part of 17th century and 18th century we hardly see this cannon and there are very limited number of uh, cannons uh, reported of this type uh, a single piece from murshidabad couple of pieces from dalatabad and very few cannons from uh, gavilgarh are reported of this type next slide please this is classic evidence of uh, detachable type of uh, gun ch chamber uh, uh, gun powder chamber from dalatabad and i kept repeating this the horizontal saws of iron so in this picture you will be able to see how those saws horizontal saws formed a barrel in the picture to your right corner this is interior shot of the cannon no the below that below that yes so this is interior portion where you are seeing these horizontal lines they are actually iron strips and they are forged together with heating and uh, if you look at the mouth part in uh, another picture uh, uh, they are turned outwards and then again they are welded to the mouth and to strengthen this horizontal bars they have uh, put a uh, circular rings as a outer cover so that is how this bangadi cannon was prepared and you can see uh, the diameter the caliber is about 35 cm so uh, the large a large cannon ball could be thrown from this uh, cannon it is quite long 4.43 meters the master created have a mm, right next slide please this is a miniature version of rot iron uh, gun this is not even a meter long uh, a smaller models or smaller guns uh, uh, could also be manufactured with this technology and you can also see jetting out iron bars from the mouth or muzzle of the cannon next slide please well this is the culmination to which one can take forged welded cannons this is a seven barrel gun from dalatabad and this is manufactured with uh, rot iron technology initially it was thought that this is made out of cast iron but uh, uh, detailed study and closer look one could understand that this is a marvel created in metal uh, so in single lightning uh, uh, from the gunpowder chamber it could fire seven shots simultaneously but 
if you look at uh, angle uh, uh, they are slightly protruding so seven cannon balls were moving in different different directions in spread out fashion and one can see the caliber of each barrel is around 5 cm so very small shot but i'm sure there are uh, effective enough in the battlefield to deal with multiple enemies next slide please this is another example of uh, forge welding and uh, uh, popularly this is known as a chilim top in dawlatabad as it is uh, fashioned in conical shape it has a wider mouth and narrow back so many people actually presume that this is just for the uh, show show of purpose uh, or this was meant uh, to fire during ceremonies but actually i think this really performed uh, a great function in battlefield because instead of a single cannon ball if you feel this piece with thousands and thousands of uh, iron nails a small uh, pellet uh, they can uh, hurt thousands and thousands of soldiers in single fire so i think this type of cannon also perform a very important role uh during uh, ongoing battles next slide please now these are two typical examples of uh, uh, cannons uh, cast in european fashion now uh, you will see that there are particular moldings towards the muzzle which were introduced by the europeans and indian choice was uh, to uh, cast this cannons uh, in almost parallel fashion from its mouth to back side so thickness of uh, desi tops was almost parallel on the exterior but europeans they actually preferred thicker back side of bridge and narrower mouth so this this was the early uh, beginning of uh, cast european artillery at dawlatabad next please well this is what i was talking about these are desi or locally uh, cast uh, iron uh, cannon which has got uh, parallel barrel so the mouth and the back side would be almost of similar diameter and uh, one can also see introduction of dragon faces so when it comes to manufacturing in india we always preferred uh, animals dragons as part of uh, uh, the gunnery culture next slide please Well, this this is one of the marvels of uh, cannons from Dalatabad. Popularly, this is called as Nanda Top. But if you actually read inscription uh, on this, uh, it is called as Kilai Shakin. Uh, in another words, a destroyer of the forts. Uh, this was the uh, original name of cannon. and this was definitely made by alangzeb because he is present here with his full epithet it abul zafar muhammad muhammad alangzeb bahadur bacha gazi and so on so that is how one can safely presume that earlier cannon did not belong to alangzeb is more than 5 meters in length and on the interior it is fabricated with uh, horizontal stars of fire and on the outer side it has a bronze casing uh, so uh, it's a composite technique and from dawlatabad you only see three cannons of this type next slide so this is a composite uh, cannon uh, having inscription uh, of a name with fateh baland 
and you know this was the title uh, confirmed on uh, dada shukoh by shah jahan himself and so this this is the only evidence of dada shukoh in form of inscription and this is on a canon in dalatabad next slide please so on summit of dalatabad you see a canon called durga top well uh, this was again a manufacture during aurangzeb period as you can see from its inscription and date but later on marathas they put the small strip with name of shri durga on top of it but again if you look at uh, technique of uh, composition on the interior this is built with forged welding so on in the inside it has got iron and outer case is bronze again this is typical technique during aurangzeb's time marathas never used this technique for manufacturing their own cannon next slide please these are a few examples of dc uh, cast iron guns uh, which are actually uh, cast in pieces and uh, then they were welded together with uh, thick rings around them so it was kind of mixed technique of forge welding and casting we need to work more on this from the technological perspective next slide please well these are some of the cannons of foreign origin as i mentioned earlier they have a smaller mouth and thicker breech this was quite logical uh, in order to sustain blast inside the barrel you need to have a thicker breech or thick back side and uh, through which cannon ball runs it, uh, it can be of a parallel shape or it could be thinner so uh, uh, next slide please so you will see emblem of dutch east india company the year of manufacturing of this gun some of the defect of casting which are seen on the back side of the gun in the middle picture uh, and uh, uh, probably a french cannon though there is no inscription but the decorations them all uh, match to french carbine so we need to explore this whether this particular gun was imported from french or spanish uh, but definitely moguls and marathas uh, did import lot of cannons from dutch british and portuguese next slide please so uh, this is a wonderful example of a dutch cannon from dalatabad you will see depiction of uh, a ship Uh, emblem of dutch east india company next slide please so now i am going to rush through some of the other forts of maratwada so uh, i am not going to describe them uh, as typologically it will be more or less repetition of what we have already seen at dalatabad so next you will be able to see names of the forts vethalwadi next slide please paranda fort uh, again uh, a composite cannon uh, from aurangzeb spread next slide please again azad parker gun uh, constructed by aurangzeb with similar technology next please and yes back side is uh, shaped like uh, face of uh, crocodile and uh, this is uh, again one of the uh, import uh, but uh, this is from 
Spain. So uh, once uh, a Portuguese empire was annexed into Spain, and during those times, uh, you can also see import of some uh, Portuguese as well as Spanish cannons uh, in can uh, in on forts of Maratwada. Next slide, please. These are some of the huge wrought iron cannons on Maratwada Fort. Next slide, please. Well, a uh, few Desi copies uh, forged by uh, Nijam Shah of uh, Hyderabad in the later period. So uh, the the shape of cannon is essentially molded after European guns copying dolphins and all. So this is how cannon was fired: uh, single uh, cannon, handheld cannon. Next slide, please. Is the port of Naladurga, and uh, this is again a uh, cast uh, iron cannon uh, composed with uh, forge welding. Uh, the mouth is again of a great dragon or maybe lion in stylized form. So this was a typically Indian choice. Next, please. Again, few examples of uh, cast iron guns. Next, please. Next, please. Next. Again, uh, nearby Fort Kanda, uh, you'll see more or less similar typology on this fort also. Next. Next. You can keep on flipping slides now until I ask you to stop. Next. Asa Fort, uh, please stop. So here we have something really interesting. Uh, so far we are talking about uh, cannons uh, uh, which are filled from mouth or muzzle loading cannons. Now at the fort of Alsa, you see a different uh, technological step in form of introduction of bridge loading cannons. So you will see a, a rectangular box type of structure on the back side of the cannon and from which a cylinder was placed inside filled with gunpowder. So there was a provision of loading cannonball uh, from front and gunpowder from the back side. So this was slight technological advance. Uh, this is the fort of Aosa in Maratwada, Usmanabad district. Next please. This is one of the magnificent cannon cast by Nijam Shah of Ahmed Nagar and stored in Aosa. This is a beautiful cast in bronze, one of the most beautiful cannons from Maharashtra context. Next, please. Well, one of the bridge loaders from Aosa. Next, please. Next. So you also see introduction of uh, uh, European style gunnery, uh, but uh, this is mostly dated to the later uh, Nizam period gunnery. Next slide, please. You'll see a lot of cannonballs littered around. 
Next, please. This is Mahal Fort on the borders of Mayathwada and uh, Vidarbha. Uh, let us come to Western Maharashtra. Next. So, uh, this is the fort of Sihagar. And from almost all the Maratha forts that the cannons you are seeing are essentially British cannons or very few lightweight cannons cast by Marathas themselves. But all cannons uh, are essentially British on Sinagar Fort. And uh, next, please. I know I'm talking more than one hour. I'm try, I'll try to wrap up this session in next 10 minutes. Uh, next yes, sir, no is, problem. Actually, the lecture is so interesting. Even we are engrossed with your lecture. You can take some more time. So whatever canons that you're seeing in front of you, they're essentially of British origin. And uh, they're found from all forts. Uh, with which we are familiar with Lohagad, Khorigad, which are all in and around Pune. Next, please. Next, please. Again, Sangram Doza or Takan Fort. Next. This is one from actually Dalatabad, just to uh, see the distance between European and Desi cannons. This is from Bhudagad, Kolhapur. Next slide. Vishalgad. We had to place this cannon on such a high platform so that people cannot damage it. Uh, this is not the ideal way we should be doing it. Uh, let us see how. Well, uh, now there is evidence from Konkan. Uh, all my knowledge uh, about, uh, uh, other than knowledge, I would say my experience of working with cannons is also credited to my friends, uh, Dr. Abhijit Ambekar and Dr. Rohini Pandey, uh, with whom I studied in Institute of Archaeology. And we worked on uh, Canons of Goa together and we came up with a book. And if you can go to previous slide, please, uh, where you see a cover page of book. Yeah, uh, back, please, back. Uh, sir, which slide, sir? This one, Rave Danda Fort is written here. No, no, prior to this. Okay, prior to this. Okay, okay this one. Uh, you can go back. Yeah, yeah, just a minute, sir. This one? No. Oh, okay, this, back. yeah, okay, okay, got it. Yes. So this is actually a cover page of a book. And the title is uh, Canons of Goa. And this is published by Broadway Publications from Goa. And actually, uh, two of my friends had uh, come to see me to Aurangabad. And I uh, took them around Dalatabad. Uh, and I explained to them, uh, this business of art is quite interesting. And they are forming certain story. So they say, I go back from Khup I do it and uh, I started visiting Goa on weekends. So, uh, and as an assistant archaeologist, my capacity was just to document them. So, all of us were assistant archaeologists. And what we did uh, faithfully was to, we documented them and we brought this documentation into public domain. You know, bringing uh, your knowledge to public domain is the most important thing that you can do. Uh, and later on, we'll see how this has facilitated us and uh, to public in general. Next slide, please. So, let us come back to Maharashtra. So, we got 
more and more inspired from uh, Portuguese of Goa, and we also started venturing in uh, on forts of Maharashtra where you have seen Portuguese evidence. So this is uh, these are cannon balls from Revdanda, and very interestingly. they were not fired from any of the cannons which were possessed by the portuguese so this is kolai fort uh, and if you can go back to previous slides with cannon balls yes so uh, again you will see a small girl standing at the scale with cannon ball So again you will see the cannon balls are quite of a large size and we looked at the diameter of uh, those cannons uh, in revdanda it was the maximum diameter of any gun based on revdanda was not more than 12 cm so we started inquiring back into uh, historical records and we came at the with a reference of a particular battle uh, with uh, murtaza nizam shah who attacked simultaneously with zamorins uh, on portuguese and portuguese fought on both sides on sea as well as land and they fought simultaneously with two powers and nizam shah could uh, nizam shah came with great fire power in shape of lot and guns with a larger die of cannon balls so that's how you get to see town of revdanda littered with this large size cannon balls which were not actually used by portuguese but portuguese guns were smaller but they could fire effectively right on target you will be surprised to know that one of the bus stops of at is still known as gola stop so if you want to get down and see if you can in balls in revdanda you just have to ask conductor for gola stop and you start your journey with one of the gola as in revdanda <laughs> next please well adjoining to that uh, there is a small beautiful fortress in form of kolai on top of which you, again you see n number of portuguese cannons and this is the first time you see introduction of uh, animal on the back side of the cannon in form of a dog so the cascable uh, in couple of cannons in kolai fort is shaped in form of a dog uh so uh, this is still a topic of research uh, why uh, uh, during the period of our way or why uh, during this colonial period also some of the cannons were shaped like uh, the cascable of cannon was shaped like an animal what they were trying to do is still a question which needs to be answered next please This is our famous Jangira Fort. It is loaded with seventy-six cannons. If you look at uh, uh, gazette, uh, early gazette uh, of uh, Jangira, there is a reference of about three hundred cannons. But at present, we don't see more than seventy-six cannons on the fort. And we have tried to map them, put them on GPS. Next, please. you obviously see some of the largest cannons in form of uh, landa kasab uh, or uh, kalal bangdi uh, on uh, jangira and uh, maybe after this presentation you can logically try to answer a question at how this large cannon which are weighing more than 28 tons were transported from land to Uh, such fort inside sea see there is also one alternative where only rings and horizontal bars could have been transported and they could have been assembled on that particular bastion 
there is a possibility well to look at other assemblage from uh, uh, janjira you will see most of the cannons are uh, cast in iron and a lot of them are imported from european powers next please so to counter uh, siddhi uh, from janjira uh, chatrapati shivaji maharaj built a fort uh, on kasa island which he named as padmadurga uh, unfortunately after fall of uh, chatrapati sambhaji maharaj uh, this fort again fell into hand, hands of siddhi and he seems to have strengthened uh, its fortifications along with the introduction of more and more european cannons so there are about 28 cannons on padmadurga and you will see all there essentially cast in iron in european fashion next please so now we come back to some of the forts in hinterland in form of rasargarh which is also in konkan and again you will see a lot of uh, european shape or uh, other british guns on rasargarh some of them are also uh, shaped by uh, desi uh, craftsman next please is uh, sagar next now let's have a look at amchi mumbai kiwa apli mumbai so uh, we have also started documenting cannons in mumbai it's little monotonous business because whatever cannons that uh, we have found so far they are mostly from british context and very few may have had the origins in portuguese period let's have a look next next slide please this is cannon from my own office and this was brought uh, during some road digging work near metro uh in it is so this is uh, typically a cast iron gun shaped on british moldings next please well uh, recently uh, while uh, doing uh, renovations of the roads in front of taj hotel near gateway of india uh, this cannons were found it is in possession of municipal corporation in wadala few cannons are reported these are quite huge they are more than 3 meters in length and they are in possession of bombay port trust next please next please gateway of india you will see couple of inverted cannon which are now used as bollard for tying up uh, boats and ships so once uh, the the use of uh, cannons fail uh, this is how uh, they came into a secondary use next please there is some um, karnak bandar which is not far off from uh, uh, chatrapati shivaji maharaj terminus next please this is our csa vs museum uh, it, it also displays some of the cast iron cannon next 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 to my surprise uh, 
I could record a, a single lot of about 13 cannons inside the premises of Mantale. Uh, there is no proper track or record of where these cannons were found and how they were transported to Mantale. But it's presumed when uh, fortifications of uh, old fort in Bombay was demolished by Britishers, some of the cannons may have been buried in the similar in same area. And when reclamation works were being carried out uh, along Marine Drive, uh, probably they recovered these cannons and they were brought to Mantale for decoration purpose. Next. A British emblem is quite visible. So now, uh, Elephanta, uh, you see this couple of cannons mounted on. Uh, very few people go to the top of the hill in Elephanta. We usually go to caves. But next time, I would also urge you to go to the hilltop and see these two magnificent pieces which came uh, uh, after the First World War. Now, there is a complete change in the technology. Now, cannons are essentially bridge loaders. So they are loading from the backside. They are not loading it from the front. And they are huge in length, they are more than 9 meters, up to 10 meters. And you can see entire mechanism of uh, loading, semi-automatic loading of shells is uh, seen underneath these cannons. Next, please. So now we'll take a quick look at uh, some of the cannons from Vidarbha. Next. Next. This is the fort of Nanala where we have found evidences of a gun uh, foundry. And uh, here are a few wrought iron cannons from Nanala fort. Next, please. If you are more interested, this is located inside Chikhalda Wildlife Sanctuary. Next, please. This is one of the uh, cannons which was forged during Nizam Shah period. And later on, it was captured by Aurangzeb and he left his inscription on this cannon with his full epitaph. And this is called as Naugaj Stove. And it is about uh, 27 foot in length. and uh this is one of the canons uh, now worshipped as god earlier i have shown you uh, references uh, of gateway of india canons which are used as bolts uh, you can go to next slide so besides tying ships after they fail into disuse we have also treated some of them as our gods. So this is again from Vidarbha region and the uh, temple is Jai Mahatopeshwari temple. So you also see canon uh, in front and personification uh, just like Durga as Mahatopeshwari. And Aplya uh, Mumbai take far Vega nahi. So this is one of the canons uh, in Karnak Bandha. And uh, this is uh, uh, currently this is worshipped as a Bhairoba, and you can see construction of a small shrine on top of cannon. And all the locals they uh, offer uh, uh, things to this Bhairoba. And now, uh, in the introduction, it was mentioned that uh, I served in the Archaeological Survey of India. So I also served in Assam for some point of time, and it was really it really benefited me to uh, understand uh, the Assamese culture, architecture, and luckily I could see also this magnificent pieces of pottery in form of Ahom cannons, and I also referred to some of the literature which uh, talks about uh, war of this great Ahom dynasty along with some local powers and they had defeated a dynasty called Chutiyas and this is uh, many items from these local tribes and n number of cannons 
of various shapes and size and large quantities of gunpowder and handheld guns was a part of this treasure and this is again uh, quite uh, prior to battle of panipat so please try to understand the point i am trying to make next please this is the masterpiece which can be ever produced uh, by uh, indian craftsman of course uh, this was done uh, under the direction of french this uh, gun is famously known as mallara howitzer and now it is kept in british museum and you will see that an elaborate carriage is provided next please on the back of that you will see uh, maratha the quite religious people so they provided temple but no this is actually a hanging plumb bob which is used uh, for leveling uh, for uh, putting the cannon in proper level so this is a beautiful application of art into something like gunnery next please so i ultimately come to my last slide where i am trying to show that gunpowder has entered to india through silk route when mongols were moving from china towards turkey or europe so definitely during sultanat period itself there was introduction of gunpowder there was no introduction of cannons at that point of time but gunpowder was certainly known prior to mughal rule then uh, we can see a proper introduction of gunnery in western india uh, by mohammad gawan and later on portuguese records also talk about seizure of goa from bijapur and uh, there in the refer to master craftsman to the emperor and they talk about their skill uh, being utilized to improve our own uh, technique of gunnery then in the east you see that there is a separate origin of gunpowder technology even ohm knew how to make gunpowder so uh, and there is also theory uh, of local scholars in northeast of india uh, who talk about uh, gunpowder technology being traveled from assam to china i am not too sure about this but at this particular moment i can definitely say that the gunpowder technology had multi centric origins in indian context so with that note next slide and thank you very much for me and i think i spoke for more than uh, one and half of a one hour 45 minutes i don't know i think i have not yes, left so yes. uh, it was it was so interesting you no know, we were totally engrossed with the lecture i can't express my gratitude you know it's really wonderful sir that you know accepted our invitation to talk and you know many of us have attended your lecture on ajinta foods and fortification but you know your expertise on cannon and gunnery you know that was just wonderful so again i would like to express my gratitude i would like to thank you sir thank you so much you know and uh, you know the entire chat box was it is full with your you know their uh, people are asking you know uh, can they uh, have your pictures but uh, it's with your permission we can personally message them and uh, people are thanking you for their appreciating us for having a wonderful session and uh, there are very few questions sir you explained it so well you know we hardly have few questions uh one question i would like to ask uh it came in a chat box that uh, what does animal motif indicates on a cannon if you look at 
variety of animals mostly uh, the fierceous animals indicating certain characteristic features for example menda or the ram canon or kilai shakin uh, it indicates uh, a particular character of ram of hitting back continuously till the enemy is exhausted so probably they are trying to imbibe uh, those characters while forging that canon itself but of course this is my uh, interpretation uh, we still need to go through a contemporary literature to see uh, what was the mindset of the uh, person who was actually shaping this canon many uh, of the canons have the dragon face or lion face so they are trying to imbibe that ferocious look and when we see dog on cascable probably probably gunner was trying to um, have loyalty of a dog in form of canon and well i forgot to mention one very important uh, thing about this medieval canon that they did have a range uh, of uh, about 700 meters to 1 and 1/2 meter 1 uh, and 1/2 kilometer Uh, at the maximum but the effective range was not more than 1000 meters so uh you hear this uh, uh, gossip by the guides that <coughs> cannon from dalatabad was throwing cannon ball in aurangabad which is 16 kilometers away <laughs> that is not possible with any of the medieval cannons they did not fire more than 1 1/2 kilometer and not even the largest cannon of malike maidan and so on thank you sir so actually there are few but due to time constraints we can't take them all just the day which community in india was involved in the making of the handling of the cannons the uh, in the initial period uh, you see uh, turks or this uh, uh rumi is uh, doing uh, everything related to canon then uh, you often uh, see mention of firans so essentially portuguese french and british uh, uh, they not only sold these cannons to us but sometimes they also provided gunners or uh, entire team uh, in order to look after this and in the later period this technology seems to have been transformed to uh, local tribes adjoining to uh, in in rajputana so you have uh, many people uh, of the caste of lohar uh, taking up uh, this particular technology and having uh, indian use of it uh, i think even the lohars of maharashtra uh, imbibe the same in the same process uh and uh, we are familiar with rohillas uh, who were looking after artillery of uh, peshwas and uh, you also see uh, brahmins like panses uh, taking up this technology during peshwa period so it not restricted to any particular caste but it was a sort of new toy and whomsoever wanted to win wanted to have a upper hand adopted this thank you sir thank you so much uh deepi ma'am to propose vote of thanks but before that i first really like to thank you sir for accepting our invitation looking forward to have a more session with you deepi ma'am over to you thank you Can I uh, can I be visible on screen or should I continue? Uh, Preeti, you are visible and also audible. Thank you, thank you. I take this opportunity to thank our uh, resource person, Dr. Tejas Garge, who is the director of Archaeology and Museums, Government of India. I greatly appreciate you, sir, on behalf of the audience of our participants. who have been glued to the screens and they were all years listening to you because of the rich amount of information that you've given 
such an enriching lecture and the slides were also so appealing appropriate and loaded with so much of content content in the sense information so sir you your expertise is brilliant and we have witnessed a really legendary speaker speak today and uh, thank you so much for uh, doing it beyond our uh, satisfaction we 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 are really thrilled to have you sir thank you i uh, thank miss uh, pooja yadav for organizing such a wonderful lecture for her great sense in choosing the best speaker for the audience and for the great meticulous effort that you have taken pooja in organizing this and checking that every little thing is in its place i thank you samiksha for the very uh, meticulous work that you have done behind the scenes and uh, for being such a lovely uh, support to pooja without you this would not have been possible samiksha our technical support mr uh, justin has taken care of uh, the zoom and the youtube uh, links and he has also uh, taken care that there are no technical glitches during the course of the session a uh, very great appreciation to you mr justin i thank the student volunteers kirti and nikita who have been monitoring the participants chats and their questions and kept the uh organizers updated about everything during the session thank you kirti and nikita i thank the participants for their overwhelming response for their great enthusiasm and their involvement during the lecture and even after the feedback links were posted we have a huge number which only shows how much intensely they are interested in this lecture thank you participants i uh, wish you all the best this is a time of information zoom boom that we are witnessing so many webinars and so many great speakers are there at our home on our screen with lovely content that we would not have found possible during our regular working days so this has come to us as a blessing in disguise thank you one and all signing off thank you preeti ma'am thank you teja sir thank you so much thank you entire team so you can uh, uh, the meeting if you want sir thank you teja sir thank you pooja thank you samiksha ma'am thank you justin so so you unmute you said you want to say something Yes, sir. I want to thank uh, from my core of my heart. Uh, uh, you know, this is just beginning, and I'm just trying to understand these things, and I'm still at the uh, preliminary level of it. If somebody has to see a real work, one has to refer to a book by Professor Balasubramanyam called Saga of Indian Canons. Okay. So you have unmuted. So you have muted yourself. Please.